Good morning, friends and family. Thank you so much for joining us today. I was up here last week, but if anybody wasn't here for that or doesn't know me in general, my name is Amanda. I am on the leadership team here at LCC, and I am blessed to be back up here again, bringing you a message continuing in the book of Joshua. Um, before we dive into the word today, I would like to pray for us to make sure that what I'm about to say is what God wants me to, and that what you hear is what he wants you to. So let's pray together now. Father God, I just thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to come together today um, as a church family, um, whether we're here in this room or whether we're watching online or watching at a later time. God, I just ask that what happens here today in this place is exactly what you want it to be, um, that we remember that you are 100% in control of all situations, all the time, all throughout history, including today, and just ask that you would bless us to learn something from your word today. You may pray. Amen. Okay, so for some of you, I already handed out some paper Bibles. We do also have, we recommend using the YouVersion Bible app if that's something that you prefer to do on your phone. Um, today we will be in Joshua chapter 10, which if you are using the Bible that I, I passed out, that begins on page 221, just to help you navigate so you don't have to find it on your own. Um, chapters 10 and 11 that we are covering today, um, just explore some topics and themes that are some of the more complicated, less fun stuff to read in the Bible. Um, we know that the Bible covers all of human history, and humans are messy. Um, so we have some messy stuff to discuss today. So just brace yourselves for that, and remember what we prayed about earlier, that God is absolutely in control of all of it. Um, again, so page 221 in the Bibles, or Joshua chapter 10 in your Bible app, if that's what you'd like to do. All right. So let's review what happens to get up to this point. Um, so we've had, I've talked about some of it, Leo's talked about some of it, we've been going back and forth on um, getting through the book of Joshua, which is a brief recap, so, which I've done multiple times, so we should have this in our brains by now, but it's always good to remember. So Joshua starts out with it being finally time for the Israelites to enter the promised land. And this land is something that God promised to them generations ago, hundreds of years ago. Um, he promised to Abraham, and then it went down through his family, and they spent some time in Egypt, and then they left Egypt, and they got to the promised land, and then they disobeyed, and then they had to wander in the desert for 40 years, and then we're finally back. And that's where Joshua starts, is that finally, after all of that, after hundreds of years, after a time in slavery, after wandering in the desert for 40 years, it's finally time. They get to enter the promised land, which was then known as Canaan. When they did arrive that first time, um, first time to the Jordan River to enter Canaan, they sent spies in to check out the land and see if it was good or bad. Um, and 10 of them came back saying, it is wonderful. All, well, all 12 came back saying, it is wonderful. But 10 of them came back saying, but the people are too scary, we can't do it. Only two said, we actually can take this. Because of those 10, the Israelite people got scared and they didn't go in. And that led us into that 40 years of wandering that I mentioned earlier. During that 40 years, all of the people that were grown-ups at the time when they arrived at the Jordan River the first time died. That included Moses. The only two that were saved from that were the two men that had gone in and spied out and said, hey, God says we can do it, we can do it. And that's Joshua and Caleb. So that's why this book is called the Book of Joshua. So now, at the beginning of Joshua, Joshua begins by leading the Israelites into this promised land, as God had promised to do. They have to start conquering the cities and destroy or drive out the inhabitants thereof so they can move in. At this time, the Israelites do start to listen to God. They start to believe that God will do what he says he's going to do, and they are successful in several conquests. We, see, we saw God miraculously help them conquer the city of Jericho with marching and trumpets instead of actual military action. Uh, we see some mistakes the first time they tried to take I, but then they ultimately did succeed when they started to follow God again. And then last week, we also learned about a different Canaanite city called Gibeon, who didn't have to be conquered because they managed to... I mean, trick the people of Israel, but convince the people of Israel into making a treaty with them. And that brings us to where we are today. These chapters, chapters 10 and 11, are a very high-level summary of the remaining, well, a lot of the remaining conquest of the Promised Land. So this story brings up a lot of challenging questions about um, having to confront some uncomfortable topics with God and his command to just wipe out these people. 
So, you know, in, in thinking about what to say here today, we have to be cautious with how we approach this story. When we look at texts like this, it's sometimes tricky to tackle them because it's a lot to take in to just hear, and these people were destroyed, and these people were destroyed, and these people were destroyed, and these people were destroyed. So one thing that I think will be helpful for us today is to just read the whole thing. We're just gonna go through it, we're gonna read every word that God has chosen to give us, and then we're gonna back up after that and start making some generalized over, um, overall observations about what's happening, we'll get a broader picture of the whole story, and then work our way into some of the deeper implications from the details. So we're gonna start, like I said, by just reading the whole thing. It's two full chapters, so buckle in. Um, again, it is page 221 if you want to turn there in the paper Bibles that I handed out. And when we're done with that, we'll digest some stuff together. All right. So if you're using the paper Bible that I handed out, the chapter 10 starts with the title of The Sun Stands Still. And that right there is a pretty cool title. It's like a hook to get you in, right? So chapter 10 starts this way. Now Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were good fighters. So Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoam, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lashish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lashish, and Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal. Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, so Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road, going up to Beth Horon, and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makedah. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled hard, large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies as it is written in the book of Jasher. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. So that's the first chunk, the way the Bible, my Bible breaks it up. So these headers were not included in the original text necessarily. They've been put in by the translators to just kind of help us section out the story. So that's the first story that we see um, Gibeon, who had made the treaty with Israel, gets attacked, likely because the people attacking them thought Gibeon might be an easier target than the whole nation of Israel, but because they were mad at Gibeon for joining Israel. So Gibeon gets attacked, Joshua attacks back to protect the people that they had made the treaty with, and we see God come through in kind of two miraculous ways. One, the hailstones taking out more people than the Israelite army did, and two, letting them have more daylight, which we will come back to in a little bit when we're diving in. The next section that I have is called Five Amorite Kings Killed, and that starts in verse 16. Now, the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave at Makeda. When Joshua was, was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave at Makeda, he said, roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. But don't stop. Pursue your enemies." Attack them from the rear, and don't let them reach their cities, for the Lord your God has given them into your hand. 
So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely, but a few survivors managed to reach their fortified cities. The whole army then returned safely to Joshua in the camp at Makkedah, and no one uttered a word against the Israelites. Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lashish, and Eglom. When they had brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. Then Joshua put the kings to death and exposed their bodies on five poles, and they were left hanging on the poles until evening. At sunset, Joshua gave the order, and they took them down from the poles and threw them into the cave where they had been hiding. At the mouth of the cave, they placed large rocks, which are there to this day. So that's the next section that this Bible splits it out into, that these five kings lose their lives. Not fun to read what happened to them. A few things I want to point out. Um, it was very customary in this time for kings to lead their armies into battle, to be the first ones risking their lives when a war happened, because they are the ones that are making the rest of these men do that. The fact that these kings chose to leave their armies to their own devices and hide in a cave shows maybe they weren't the best kings. That alone would not be enough for what happened to them, but the broader context um, of what God is doing here we'll get into in a little bit. I just wanted to point out that specific thing that these weren't great guys. Um, next section for my Bible is titled Southern Cities Conquered, starting in verse 28, so we'll read that now. That day, Joshua took Makeda. He put the city and its king to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it. He left no survivors, and he did to the king of Makeda as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Makeda to Libna and attacked it. The Lord also gave that city and its king into Israel's hand. The city and everyone in it Joshua put to the sword. He left no survivors there, and he did to its king as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Libna to Lashish. He took up positions against it and attacked it. The Lord gave Lashish into Israel's hands, and Joshua took it on the second day. The city and everyone in it he put to the sword, just as he had done to Libna. Meanwhile, Horam, king of Gezer, had come up to help Lashish, but Joshua defeated him and his army until no survivors were left. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Lashish to Eglon. They took up positions against it and attacked it. They captured it that same day and put it to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it, just as they had done to Lashish. Then Joshua and all Israel with him went up from Eglon to Hebron and attacked it. They took the city and put it to the sword, together with its king, its villages, and everyone in it. They left no survivors. Just as at Eglon, they totally destroyed it and everyone in it. Then Joshua and all Israel with him turned around and attacked Debir. They took the city, its king, and its villages, and they put them to the sword. Everyone in it they totally destroyed. They left no survivors. They did to Debir and its king as they had done to Libna and its king and to Hebron. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, and the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua subdued them from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza and from the whole region of Goshen to Gibeon. All these kings and their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Take a pause right there, because that is the end of chapter 10. That is not a fun section. <laughs> we see, like I mentioned earlier, just city after city and people after people fall to the sword of Israel and be completely wiped out. That is not a comfortable topic for us to read about today, and I will definitely dive into the way we can get our heads around it, not that it would ever be comfortable, but the way we can understand the bigger picture of what God is doing here when we finish reading chapter 11 here. So chapter 11 starts off with the northern kings defeated. So chapter 10 ended with the southern kings. Chapter 10, 11 begins with the northern kings. We're taking an entire region. So 11 starts out like this. When Jabin king of Hazor heard of this, he sent word to Jobab king of Maiden, to the kings of Shimron and Akshaph, 
and to the northern kings who were in the mountains, in the Arabah, south of Kinnereth, in the western foothills, and in Naphoth Dor on the west. To the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, and Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites below Hermon in the region of Mizpah. They came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them, because by this time tomorrow I will hand all of them slain over to Israel. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. So Joshua and his whole army came against them suddenly at the waters of Merom and attacked them, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. They defeated them and pursued them all the way to Greater Sidon, to Misraphath, Maim, and to the valley of Mizpah on the east, until no survivors were left. Joshua did to them as the Lord had directed. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots. At that time, Joshua turned back and captured Hazor and put its king to the sword. Hazor had been the head of all these kingdoms. Everyone in it they put to the sword. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed, and he burned Hazor itself. Joshua took all these royal cities and their kings and put them to the sword. He totally destroyed them, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Yet Israel did not burn any of the cities built on their mounds, except Hazor, which Joshua burned. The Israelites carried off for themselves all the plunder and livestock of these cities, but all the people they put to the sword until they completely destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed. As the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did it. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua took this entire land, the hill country, all the Negev, the whole region of Goshen, the western foothills, the Arabah, and the mountains of Israel with their foothills, from Mount Halak, which rises toward Seir, to Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon, below Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings and put them to death. Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time. Except for the Hivites living in Gibeon, not one city made a treaty of peace with the Israelites, who took them all in battle. For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel, so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy, as the Lord had commanded Moses. At that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites from the hill country, from Hebron, Debir, and Anab, from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Anakites were left in Israelite territory. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did any survive. So Joshua took the entire land, just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel, according to their tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. So that finishes up chapter 11 with those northern kings being defeated. If you peek ahead, chapter 12, which we won't be covering today, includes a list of the defeated kings, just an even higher level summary of what we just went through together. Whether we're looking at just a list or whether we're reading the actions that actually happened to make that conquest take place, it's a lot to take in. Um, so let's make a few observations about these chapters overall. The first thing you might notice, besides that amazing miracle with the sun that God pulls, which we will talk about more in a moment, is that a lot of these details are very repetitive. Ultimately, this plays out like a list of people and places that the Israelites have conquered. It seems kind of mechanical and emotionally detached. You kind of can forget that these are human beings that we're talking about being taken over. And that's by design, because these chapters are a summary of the Israelites' conquest of the Promised Land and the destruction of the Canaanites. It's not intended to be touchy-feely. It is intended to be a listing of the facts, that these are the things that happened. But because this summary is so emotionally detached, the descriptions of the violence and the killing that we get here can seem disproportionately harsh. It can seem like God himself is detached from the actions that are, place, that are taking place here. This seems harsh, callous, even cruel. And that brings up some tough questions, questions Christians often shy away from because we don't feel like we have good answers. Not sure if you've ever experienced this, but I know when I am asked about what the things that God did in the Old Testament, this, this 
command to completely destroy a people group. I'm quick to say things like that was then, this is now, you know, make excuses for why it is different and just not want to really sit with the information. Um, but today, we are. We're here together and we're going to sit with it. We have questions come up like, how can a loving God order the deaths of entire people groups, including people that weren't in the army, including women, including children? Isn't that genocide? That's the definition, right? Is God evil? And it's tempting to just dismiss these questions, to make excuses, like I mentioned, to say maybe these stories of destruction are exaggerated, or that the Canaanites had it coming, even the kids, or that it was how God had to deal with people then, but it's different now. And although there is some truth to those statements, it is, it is fair to say that historically, outside the Bible and inside the Bible, Near Eastern war stories were typically exaggerated and embellished to favor the victors. That is a thing that we can see outside the Bible. So that is a piece of this, yes. Uh, historically, the Canaanites, the majority of them living in this land, did have a violent and oppressive culture. Yes, we can see that outside the Bible, too. That is a piece of this, too. And there are important differences for those of us living now in a post-Jesus space than in the pre-Jesus space. But none of those individual things, or even the collective whole of those things, allow us to really get the heart of this issue. They bypass the deeper concerns and kind of miss the point of this passage. The overall point of this story is that this is a snapshot of God's judgment. It is. No matter how we rationalize it, this is judgment. And that's scary. <laughs> and it should be. The violence and the harshness of God's judgment should hit us hard. It should challenge us. It should make us uncomfortable. And I think there are two reasons that these stories have the heavy effect on us that they have. First, because of our own sin, we can't truly appreciate the gravity of sin. We can't truly appreciate what sin really causes in this world. We might agree intellectually somewhere in our minds with the idea that sin deserves death. We might be able to say that out. But, and we understand that the Bible says that, so we have to agree with it on the surface if we're choosing to be people that believe the Bible. But at least for me, there is a part of me deep down that doubts that, that says, well, I mean, I know sin is bad, but I sin, right? I know, I know I do, and I don't really deserve to die, do I? There are people that are a lot worse than me, and I think each of us would probably say that about ourselves. We're, we're trying here, right? We're doing our best. Like, surely that can't be the way this happens. And I think one of the things that God wants us to see with passages like this is that he was reminding the Israelites that, yeah, sin is really really bad, and the only way to overcome that is through relationship with him. He gives us a way out, absolutely, yes. So while sin may cause this kind of judgment, this level of destruction, maybe metaphorically in our lives, probably we're not going to get completely wiped out by an army invading, I sure hope not anytime soon, um, but we do see the effects of sin in our lives. Um, but we also are given that space to step out of that and that, that redemption that God is able to give us. But it really is, sin is really bad and judgment is real. Um, second, we in a post-Jesus world have a kind of built-in moral code, this sense that the world shouldn't be this way. Like, we, we know, we, we, we feel it in our hearts and in our souls that this is not the world God wanted to make. And we can see that in the story of the Garden of Eden way back in Genesis, that God did create a space without sin. That was the original creation. And now we have in us a longing to get back to that time. Violence, sin, and death are aberrations. Because we are created in the image of God the same way that Adam and Eve were, and because we specifically do live in a post-Jesus world, we live in a time where Jesus' influence in the world has mitigated the effect of sin and reshaped our perspectives. And we have an inherent godly disgust and discomfort for what happens in this story. So we live in a space that is just different from the people that were living in a pre-Jesus time where we can see this bigger picture, this idea that there's a way out of this. This doesn't have to be like this. So we don't want to sit with this stuff. But again, here we are. So we're going to dig into a few of the details that we read in the long passages earlier today. Something that is important to note is that the Canaanites had 
ample warning to surrender. In fact, chapter 10, if you want to flip back to the beginning of that, it starts out with the king of Jerusalem recognizing that the Israelites had destroyed Jericho and I, and that they had made a treaty with the Gibeonites. He knew. He knew exactly what happened. And with the larger context of Joshua and the books that come before it in the Bible, we know the Canaanites had known about the power of God and the miracles that he performed in Egypt 40 years earlier. They knew what he had done on the east side of the Jordan. They knew what he had done all along the way. And they were sure, confident at this point, that he was absolutely with the Israelites and that they were living in the land God had promised them. They knew what was coming. They knew they were being threatened with, dis with destruction. What happened in today's passages did not come as a surprise to those kings. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm in charge of an entire nation of people, and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that an army is coming that has a God behind it that can and will do whatever it takes to get me out of the space I'm currently occupying, I am begging, I am running, I am like I'm pleading, I'm doing whatever it takes to avoid the destruction of my people. And these people, these kings did not do that. They saw the fact that Israel did make a treaty. They knew that that was at least a partial option, and they still chose violence. They chose to band together and try to fight this unstoppable God. So even though the Israelites were commanded by God to show absolutely no mercy, we have seen, as we've read these last several weeks, and we see it continuing forward in the Bible, where requests for mercy are honored anyway. At the end of the day, God is a merciful God. He's not different today than he was in the Old Testament. He didn't change. He always is willing to allow mercy, the same way he did for the Gibeonites, and the same way he did for Rahab's family, the same way we talked about last week that he may have done for the people of Shechem. Even though the command is, show no mercy, if it's asked for, we see it granted. So these kings had that option, and they chose not to take it. They had abundant opportunities to repent, but they chose violence to the bitter end. The next detail, we see the same thing play out. Next, in the chapters we read, if you want to keep like, leafing back through, Joshua asks, asks God to make the sun stand still in the sky, and God does. Now, it's not, you have as much information as I have about how that happened, right? It's not super clear why Joshua asked God to do this specifically or what God did to make it actually happen scientifically. The traditional view is that Joshua just needed a longer day. He needed more daylight to chase down the Amorites that he was currently chasing. They didn't have the benefit of like an LED flashlight or floodlights or things like that. It's hard to fight while holding a torch, right? So he needed more daylight, possibly, maybe. That's an interpretation. It's not explicitly stated in the text. In the text, it's just simply stated that Joshua asks for this as a sign to show God's power and the fact that he's with the Israelites. There are several theories about how scientifically God pulled this off. I mean, maybe he did completely halt the rotation of the earth. He made it. He set it to rotate. He absolutely could do that. Maybe it was some kind of light refraction, you know, in the clouds. There are things that people have theorized of how this could happen with, you know, the miracle of physics, which God also created, or maybe he just slowed down the turning of the earth to the point where it seemed that the sun had stopped in the sky and the day was, in fact, lengthened. That seems most likely to me. Seems like it would have the least, you know, widespread ripple effects of problems other than just stopping the spin of the axis. But again, God can do whichever one of those options he wants to do, and he did. Uh, it doesn't really matter, because here's the point. This miraculous sign was incredibly visible. Anybody in that region, anybody even on the other side of the earth, would have known something just happened. Like, this is, this is wrong, this is different. People had been keeping track of time using the sun, using sundials for a long time. They would have noticed. This would have been an inescapable sign that God was doing a thing, like that, this, that something big is happening, which means that all of those kings that we read about in the next chapter, chapter 11, would have seen it. 
that would have been yet another warning to them that this God is not only in charge here on earth, but he is in charge on a space level, right? Like he's in charge on a much bigger level. He controls the stars, he controls the sun, he controls the spinning of the earth. It's not just he can move a human person from here to here, it's the whole thing. All of it's his. And these kings saw that happen. In addition, we read these quickly. Like, I know it was still long, and it still took us a few minutes, but we got through it in a day, right? Um, these actual conquests, it's mentioned toward the end of, I think, chapter 11, where it said that he fought these people for a long time. This was actually over the course of five to ten years that we covered the period that we read about today. Five to ten years of just one more domino falling, one more domino falling, one more domino falling. These kings had time. They had time to make a different choice. That was plenty of time for anyone that wanted to, even if their rulers are making harebrained choices, any individual people within those cities could have run. And I hope that they did, that anybody that truly believed that God was who he said he was had an opportunity to get out of there. But the rulers, at least, um, knew that judgment was coming and they persisted in their rebellion and their staunchness to choose to stand up and fight. And we see at the end of chapter 11 how that ultimately ends with people, the people of Israel taking over the whole area. Joshua chapter 11 verses 19 and 20 sums it up like this. Except for the Hivites living in Gibeon, not one city made a treaty of peace with the Israelites who took them all in battle. For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy as the Lord had commanded Moses. So this specific passage can also be a little uncomfortable for us, even with all of the added context that we have gone through together today. But we should confront it. We should talk about it. How is it fair or righteous that it says God hardened their hearts? that he made them be stubborn just so that he could destroy them. There's not an easy answer to that question, but there are a couple of things to keep in mind. First is that God had given the Canaanites more than 400 years while the Israelites were in slavery in Egypt to repent and seek mercy, and they had continued in their sin. This was seen all the way back in the time of Abraham, where we see God's judgment against the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, which were in Canaan. Some of the Canaanites were full of evil even then, and God destroyed those cities at that time, but allowed other Canaanites to live and continue to seek deeper into their sin. This hardening of hearts was not one-sided. Yes, God hardened their hearts, but they chose sin and rebellion all on their own beforehand. So they stepped into sin they did not accept the opportunity to repent. And then, yeah, God hardened a little. And then they choose to step deeper into sin. And then, yeah, God hardened a little. And this went back and forth and back and forth to the point where they ended up where they are, where we read today. It was a mutual process. On God's part, it was for the purpose of displaying his power and judgment and ultimately being faithful to his promise to those Israelite people. The second big picture thing we should remember about this today is that God is sovereign. This is something that we struggle to accept. No matter how big and powerful we know he is, it's easy to believe that he's in charge when things are good. It is harder to believe that he's in charge when we see things like this. We like to think that we're in control of our lives and that we control our destinies, but the truth is we don't. God is in complete control. We all every one of us start out with hard hearts, and it is only through God's mercy that he chooses to soften our hearts to allow us to seek his mercy. Now, that's not to say that we have no responsibility. You know, we are responsible for our sin. And although it seems like God's sovereignty and mankind's responsibility may contradict each other, it's the ever uh, debated topic of do we have free will or is God ultimately sovereign? And the answer is yes to both, somehow, in a way that is complicated for human brains to wrap our heads around. But I don't know about you, but if we had a God that was small enough for me to fully internalize and understand, I don't think he'd be a big enough God for me to worship. So these things that seem mutually exclusive aren't. They work together for God's purposes. I don't know how, because it's beyond my comprehension, and it's beyond yours too, and that's okay. 
The third big picture thing is that God is not evil for righteously judging evil. In fact, if he allowed the terrible violence and oppression that had been happening among the Canaanite cultures to continue unchecked with no chance of change, remember there, there were many chances to change, that would be evil. If he let this just continue, that would not be a, a righteous choice. The Canaanites were beyond seeking mercy. They had been given opportunity after opportunity for generations to change their ways, and they had not. They clung to their sin to the point where the only thing left for them was to be judged. And the truth is that God brings this judgment extremely reluctantly. He waited a long time. He allowed his chosen people, his special people, the Israelites, to exist in slavery for generations to give the Canaanites time to change their ways on this. He allowed his own people to be oppressed, to give these people the opportunity to make different choices. We see him be reluctant to do these things. We see the same thing when he brought judgment through the flood back in Genesis. He waited until he had no other choice but to judge. In the time of the flood, we are told that there was only evil in the hearts of the people all the time. Things had gotten to a point where nobody's ever thinking about a single thing that's good. And that's when he acted. Another thing we saw in the flood narrative back in Genesis is that God's heart was deeply troubled. Another way to say this is that his heart was broken. This judgment that he determined he had to bring broke his heart. Bringing judgment always breaks God's heart but he is true to who he is, and who he is is righteous and good. Again, we see this judgment play out in our own lives on a much smaller scale, where if we step out of his path that we talked about last week, we will see consequences. He doesn't love that. He wants us to live in that space of blessing and of obedience and of just continuing communion and, uh, and community with him. And when, it's when we step out that he has to nudge us back in. Now, this that we're reading about today is a heck of a nudge. <laughs> it's a big one. Um, but again, we built up to this over hundreds of years. So we see this apparent conflict between judge, ju God's judgment and his mercy just all throughout Scripture. From the very beginning with Adam and Eve, all the way to the last pages of Revelation, God's mercy and judgment are held in this tension where we're kind of pulling back and forth between God is merciful, yes, but he is also just. And this is a thing that kind of tug of wars throughout the entirety of biblical history and all the way to us today. But what we see here in Joshua and what we consistently see again and again is a God who warns of his coming judgment and then withholds it just as long as he possibly can so that he can extend mercy to anyone and everyone who would ask for it. Peter explains this in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, which I'll read for you now. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You may have known someone in your life who is praying for the end of times, that wants Jesus to come back today. And I'll admit that there are times when I think that too, like, man, can we just be done? You know, this human life, the struggles that we have, the governments that we're under, the things in this life are complicated and hard, and wouldn't it be great to just get to be in communion with God? But he is not slow, he is patient because I'm sure you also can think of people in your life that you love dearly that have not yet come to know him, and he's giving them time. He's giving them time because he is patient, because he pursues mercy over judgment every time. Judgment is an absolute last resort to deal with sin. In fact, God is so committed to offering mercy over judgment that he decided to take the penalty of sin, the righteous, just penalty of sin, upon himself in the form of Jesus Christ on the cross at Easter that we celebrated just a few weeks ago. The truth is he will do whatever it takes to make mercy an option. And what it ultimately took is the life of his son, Jesus. Jesus willingly took his father's judgment on himself because offering mercy was more important than avoiding the pain of death, and he had a painful death. 
you were worth it to him. So I don't want you to internalize from this story that we are so terrible that we deserve death. That's not the big picture. The big picture is we are so incredibly valuable that we were worth the death of God himself because that is the amount that he loves us. The the love he has for us, the mercy he shows to us outweighs the judgment every time. So it's at the cross that we see, instead of this tension between mercy and judgment, they paradoxically meet. You and I, all of the world that wants to get it, get God's mercy while Jesus gets the judgment. Judgment still exists. It has to. It is right and just, but he takes it. He loved us so much that he followed us into the grave to offer us that mercy. He pursues us. He chases us down with his mercy. That is how committed to mercy God is. I want you to think in your own lives about the ways that Jesus has pursued you into the places that you have chosen to go. Maybe you are a fortunate person who was raised knowing the love of Jesus from the very earliest days of your life, and maybe you weren't. But either way, no matter how early you knew who he was, we all had some rebellion in our lives. And we've all experienced God coming to us where we are. And that is something that Jesus did for us in the big picture way on the cross at Easter. We can know, just like the Canaanite kings knew, that judgment is coming. But through Jesus, mercy is available to anyone who would receive it. So what does this mean for us practically today? If you are someone who hasn't stepped into following Jesus, who hasn't received that mercy and accepted it wholeheartedly into who you are, today's your day. And I don't mean that to say today's the last day. I don't think it is, (laughs) because God tells us that we won't know the day or the hour, but why not today? This could be a wonderful day to do it. Why wait? You can have the full life that God wants for you now, today. So take him up on the offer. If you are someone who has been following Jesus for a while, who has internalized that promise of who he is and what he will do for you, um, then I want you to step into being people of his mercy, people who extend that out to others. God called us to be like him. The word Christian, etymologically, means little Christ that we are supposed to be small versions of who Jesus is. Now, none of us is going to accomplish him in his entirety. That's a little blasphemous, right? He's perfect. We are not. But between us, the collective whole of Christianity, not just within this church, but within the entire Christian community worldwide, can give slivers of Jesus to the people that we see. We can give, you know, we can give the pieces of him that we are gifted with out to the people around us. So I encourage you to do that, to go out and to be a blessing to people showing them the love that God has for them that he has already poured into you and the mercy that Jesus has made available to them. So that's my encouragement for you this week. That is the end of my message. I want to go ahead and pray for us together, and then the elders have an announcement that they're going to come up and make once we finish praying. Father God, I just thank you so much for your blessing of letting us worship you today for the fact that you are here with us in every moment, and for the fact that you give Jesus to us. That you didn't make us wait generations and hundreds of years to choose your mercy. You just handed it to us when you gave us Jesus on the cross. God, I ask that the people in this room would be able to step out this week into the community and let them know how loved they are by God. That we would not be stingy with the love we have received, but that we would hand it out freely. Father God, I thank you for the time that you've given us here today, and I ask that you would bless the things that the elders are about to share. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amanda. So again, if you guys don't know me, I'm Chuck. This is Joe. We serve on the elder board here. Um, Jacob is not here today. He also serves on the board. Their family is dealing with some sickness today, so we pray that that moves out of their house quickly, um, because I know he was planning on being here as well for this, but um, we do have an important announcement to share basically about the future of the church, Um, and I know people from our leadership team tried to reach out to everybody we could track down contact information for um, over the past week to kind of let you guys know, so 
hopefully this isn't a surprise for anybody what we're going to say. If it is, I apologize. Um, but um, so after, so after a lot of months of prayer, discussion, meetings, um, our leadership team feels that it's um, time for our ministry as Lafayette Community Church to wind down and begin to draw that ministry to a close. Um, again, it's not, it's not a decision <clears throat> that's been made lightly, um, but just like as we've looked back over the past year, we've seen God close door after door after door that would have allowed us to maintain our ministry as Lafayette Community Church. We've also seen God open a handful of doors and paths for us that have kind of just confirmed for us that this is this is the path that we need to take as a church and um, yeah like so basically our final our final service that's going to be like normal service is going to be Sunday May 5th um, and there's going to be a lot more details that we'll be sharing in the weeks following this um, over the next few weeks leading up to May 5th. But I say that the 5th is our last service. It's not the last time that we plan to get together as this group. Um, I want to kind of turn it over to Joe here to share our plans for some of the weeks following May 5th. Thank you, Chuck. Um, our plans following May 5th. Um, so uh, we as the elders and the leadership team are committed to carrying out the message of God and the gospel. And so uh, our plans, our intention are to continue to meet, not in a service uh, capacity, but to talk to anybody that would like help transitioning to another church, looking to, you know, what should be, what. You, questions you should be asking for another church and then on the Sundays themselves um, we would probably get together and try out another church if anybody has suggestions or uh, a church that they have heard about or went to the went to in the past we could uh, you know it, during the week we could probably live stream or not live stream but show some of the, the stuff that they've done um, you know we talk to the pastor ahead of time, try and get, let them know that there would be a group of, you know, five to 15 of us coming in, and we would go with you. Uh, you know, we can't all go to all the churches, but we could, uh, you know, help winnow it down to help make sure everybody transitions into a, a church family that, that feels comfortable, and, and, you know, the elders will, will stay you know, helping you through all of that as long as we need for at least a month, but for, for as long as you all should be. Thanks, Joe. So yeah, like, it's one of the things, as we've talked about this, like transition is incredibly difficult. Going to a church, being a first time visitor to a church is incredibly difficult. Um, I know for me personally, like the things that churches do that they say is great things to reach new people. Like you walk in the door and somebody's like, hi, welcome to church, we're so glad. It's like, I'm the type of person like, stay away. <laughs> I just wanna sit here. And, um, but you know, like transition, it's tough, but our team, we wanna do what we can to kind of help in that transition. Um, and it's easy, like, it's easy, and I have to remind myself of this a lot, it's easy to look at this as, oh, the church has failed. But we're Christians, and we can look at that from a different, different lens because it's never been, it's never been about us. It's never been about the organization, Lafayette Community Church. Um, it's always been about Jesus, about the gospel, and even if our ministry as the Little C Lafayette Community Church Church closes or comes to an end, the Capital C Church is still going strong, um, and churches just. Overall, they all have life cycles. Churches are born, churches are grow, churches shrink, something. and then eventually every church is gonna die. Um, but the church never dies. 
And we simply, like, as a church, as Lafayette Community Church, we've reached the point where we just, we simply don't have the resources to really do ministry, to really reach our community and reach others for Jesus. All of our resources right now are going to keep the lights on in this building. All of our, most of our people are volunteering, like, three or four Sundays a month just to keep Kidopolis running or keep other programs going. Um, and at that point, like most of our people just, we don't have the energy left to do outreach and outreach is what the church is really supposed to be about. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot of great people and the, my thought is like, how much more effective can our people be blessing a church that already like has the resources to maintain a building and to offer the different classes and stuff. We could be a huge blessing to another church. Um, and it's okay, and I would, I would even go so far as to say it's healthy to be sad and to mourn this, but I also want to caution people to like not let your minds go down the what if rabbit hole. Like, what if we had done this differently? Or what if we tried this thing? What if this person had done this other thing instead? Because all that really leads to is discouragement, resentment, hurt feelings. The simple fact is if God wanted us to continue to exist as the organization known as Lafayette Community Church, he would have made a way where there seems to be no way. <laughs> so for me, like I don't see it as a failure, but I see it as God using us showing us that he wants us to be more effective at our mission, our mission of reaching the community, helping people follow Jesus. Um, and on the topic of us being able to be a blessing to other churches, um, God's kind of given us the opportunity to do just that recently. Um, we've been in discussions, had a few meetings with the leadership from another local church in West Lafayette, um, and they are interested like they're in the process of launching a new church on the on this side of Lafayette and essentially are looking for a building and we conveniently have a building that we don't own outright and a lot of debt we need to get rid of um, and God's opened a door for us to be able to bless this church with a building that essentially just for what we owe on it like if we sell the building um, our goal is to sell the building, sell the building to them for what we owe. It gives them a fully set up, fully furnished church that they can basically hit the ground running in and at a significantly lower cost than they could go out and buy another building. Um, so that's, um, and that like, that'll allow this building to continue being a church. Whereas if we just put the building on the market, sold it for whatever, like, who knows what the building could end up being. Um, and we really, like, we put a lot of work into making this a nice church facility. We want it to stay that way. We want to be able to bless the community in that way. So that's kind of our goal. Again, we'll have more information in the weeks leading up to the 5th. Um, and we're still planning on having our the yard sale on the 27th. The funds from that are going to go to bless the different missionary families that our church has supported over the years. Um, and the main thing, like, we just hope, like, when you make announcements like this, it's like, is, are people going to stick around, or is everybody, like, coming out of here today? Okay, bye. I'm going to find somewhere else and see you all. Um, hope everybody will continue to stick around with us for these last few weeks. Um, and try to be here on the 5th for our final service as we kind of worship together in this building for the last time. We, we're planning on taking some time to just look back on the ministry that we've had as a church, spend some time together in fellowship afterwards, um, tossed around, like firing up the grill and having hamburgers and hot dogs afterwards. Somebody else mentioned tacos because, is it Cinco de Mayo that weekend or something? So who knows? We want to have a big party and celebrate what God has done for our community through our church that week. So again, please try to be here for that. Um, and then we're still, again, there's still details and stuff up in the air, but if you're a member plan on the fifth, having a vote um, at the end of service, because there's some a few things, just bylaws on the, the ugly legal side of churches that we have to still jump through. 
Um, so plan on one or more votes at the end of service there. Um, but yeah, so we've got one more song, Joe. Is there anything else you wanted to add? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, there has been, uh, so most, if not everybody knows that there is a church that also uses our building, uh, Love Life. The negotiations that we're in, Love Life will still get, continue to be able to use the building. And so uh, even, you know, as we close, you know, that, that it's a very small church, you know, five or six people, I think, but they'll, they'll still be blessed in that manner. Uh, there's negotiations, making sure that some of the missions are still taken care of, things like that. Um, I guess some of this goes back to Joshua that we've been talking about where Moses led everybody out of Egypt, or, you know, wandered around in the desert for 40 years, and all the work that he did, and he followed what God told him to do, and, you know, then he, he died just before they entered the promised land. So I don't think that this is a, a failure or anything. All of the work that we've done, all of the ministry that's come out of the church, all of the love and the, the, everything that we have for each other, that's continuing on, and God will continue to build on it and move that forward.